of objectified labor, right? And she says, which is rigorous, rigorously distinguished from human activity. Now, I'm going to read another quote, right? So, we're going to talk about sort of representation in this value labor distinction, right? Just like we were talking about sign signified. Um, and for those of you who watched my series, and I know many of you already watched, completed the series, for those of you who watched the series, you'll have a deeper understanding of the significance of what she's saying here. Okay, let me read another section. She says on an another page, in the Foucault Deleuze conversation, remember what we were talking about before, in the Foucault Deleuze conversation, the issue seems to be that there is no representation. Right? There is no, rep actually, let me say it properly, there is no representation, no signifier. Right? She says, no signifier. Where's the signifier? Well, the signifier is here. Right? Okay, so let's think about that. And then I'll go back and explain this. So, and let's write it down so we don't forget. She says, according to Foucault and Deleuze, um, no signifier. Okay. So she says, in the Foucault, you can see why you need to have a lot of background understanding to understand Spivak. We haven't gotten really into what she's attempting to do here, um, or even address the question of can the, uh, the answer to the question, can the subaltern speak? But I'm spending this much time because, um, it, you know, I think it's important that we know what authors are uh, attempting to, to, to say. Um, in the Foucault de Luz conversation, the issue seems to be that there is no representation, no signifier, um, is it to be presumed that the signifier has already been dispatched? There is then no sign structure operating experience, right? We understand what that means if we, and I can't get into it now, but the condition for our understanding for epistemology is sort of this linguistic account, this relationship between the things that we say and the ideas that we have sort of generally, grossly stated. I've explained this in far more detail in the videos, I'm not going to do that now. Um, in our experience, and thus might one um, lay semiotics to rest, right? So this question, she asked this herself, should we get rid of semiotics, Foucault Deleuze? Because there is no signifier anymore, the signifier is done, so is it, is it an end to semiotics? Um, there's a bit of tongue-in-cheek in that question, I think. <laughs> That's just my interpretation. Um, theory is a relay of practice, thus laying problems of theoretical practice to rest, and the oppressed can now can know and speak for themselves. So if it's the case that w there is no longer um, the signifier, right, there's no longer the signifier, signified relationship, then is it the case that I no longer need representation, right? I can now speak for myself as the oppressed, right? As the oppressed, as the subaltern, um, I can now speak for myself. Is it the case that, you know, now the subaltern can speak for themselves because there is no need for representation. I'm not going to answer that question. Um, there's another thing now. Now let's go back to page 71. Page 71. Listen to this. The small peasant. Now she's, she, she actually gave you the answer before she asked the question. She gives you the answer first. On an earlier page, she tells you the answer. On a later page, she asked the question, right? And basically, it is, there's a few questions. The first thing, the first question is, is it to be presumed that the signifier has already been dispatched? That's the first question. The next question is, um, might we lay semiotics to rest? Because the oppressed can speak for themselves. What she says in an earlier passage, my pagination uh, 71, she says the following. The small peasant proprietor cannot represent themselves. She says it right there. The small peasant proprietor cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. I'm going to draw this out in a second. Um, uh, they must be represented. Their representative, the individual who represents them, must appear simultaneously as their master. That's uh, like right there. I, you just got to pause and take that in because that's heavy, right? Uh, I'll read this again. The small present proprietor cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. Their representative must appear simultaneously as their master as an authority over them, as unrestricted governmental power that protects them from the other classes and sends them rain and sunshine from above. I mean, that's just, that's just magic. <laughs> Amazingly, profoundly well-written. Uh, it's just, yeah, I, I mean, that's just, that's heavy, right? That's heavy. Okay, 
What in the world is Spivak saying? Before we get to this, signified, 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 um, signifier. Um, I say the word. I say the word tree. Or I write the word tree, and then I think of the concept tree. Right, so that this points to the concept, roughly speaking. The sound pattern points to the concept. Right? I say something, and we know from, uh, from uh, Saussure that it doesn't have to be actual um, physiological wave frequencies, not sound pattern that sense, because sound pattern exists as a psychological state. I've gone into more detail, I'm not going to do that right now, but if that didn't make sense, I apologize, watch the videos. But basically, keep it, keep it simple, stupid. The stuff that we say points to ideas. That's basically the idea, in a very gross generalization. But you guys know about semiotics, or you have the opportunity to know more in depth because I've done videos. Now, so there is a sense in which the signifier triggers, points to, identifies this concept. What she does, it's, it's, it's amazing, right, at this point, is she's saying, I, the oppressed, I, the oppressed, as oppressed, cannot be direct, I, I don't have, there isn't a one, there is, there isn't a one to one, there isn't a one to one relationship between me and the powers that be. I am only represented insofar as I first have to go to my representer, right, my representative, R-E-P-R-E-S-E-N-T-A-T-I, a representative who is simultaneously my master. Right? Obviously, I, you know, this is sort of, she doesn't say this, and I, well, actually, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Okay, so, um, it, it's some powerful stuff, but I can't get into it now. So, with respect to, with respect to my relationship with my representative, what ends up happening is that I need acknowledgement, right? I am justified. I am justified. My existence is only justified insofar as it, my subjectivity, my existence is recognized by my master. And the only way that I am recognized by my master is by oppression. Thus, you draw the conclusion that my existence is only valid and recognized insofar as I am oppressed. Which is why I have such huge problems with um, sort of the diagnostic aspects of psychology because there used to be the case that um, wanting to be free was a psychological delusion, a psychological problem, right? Because our relationship with our overlord masters was such that they constructed our identity insofar as our identity was one of oppression. So the, the idea of being free was, you're delusional. And we all know that this is crap, right? We disproved this years later. Another example, and I've said this a billion times in all of my videos, DSM, uh, diagnostic Statistics Manuals, psychologists used to diagnose pathologies. In, I think, the second version of it, homosexuality was classified as pathology. It's no longer classified as a pathology, in part because of Foucault's discourse on, on, on power. So it's not the case that she doesn't, Spivak doesn't recognize that Foucault is a powerhouse, that he's, he's no small thinker. She's like, you guys are just being a little, you guys are being a little too flippant in your words, I think, is my interpretation she's saying here, right? So what ends up happening is that we have this sense in which we are existence only justified and recognized insofar as we are oppressed. Now, this structure, this model of the relationship between the individual and the individual's oppressor, in a Freirian sense, in a Marxist sense, all of these senses sort of interrelate, is emblematic in this labor value relationship, right? Labor is the trigger. Labor is the signifier. Labor is the sound pattern, if you will, that points to the thing that is of utmost importance, that points to the overarching concept, and that is one of value. So that when we're talking about value in a Marxist sense, actually what we're saying is that, it, it, and I'm not going to get into the, the various forms of labor, and she talks about sort of commerce and intercourse and all of intercourse in the sense of exchange, um, in, in the creation of value, but that labor directs, it serves as the signifier